Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Patient Winter Webinar Series. This is Life After Bladder Removal, Selecting Your Best Urinary Diversion, Candid Conversation with Dr. Alexander Kudikoff from Fox Chase Cancer Center. We're very thrilled that you're here. I'd first like to thank our sponsors for tonight's program, Genentech, EMD Serrano, and Merck for their support of this and all of our webinar series programs for 2017. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Alexander Kudikoff. Dr. Kudikoff, welcome. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Dr. Kudikoff, thank you so much for joining us. We're very excited to have you here, and I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Perfect. Stephanie, thank you so much, and uh, what a privilege it is to uh, participate in this webinar. So I thought I'd start with some slides, sort of just introduction to bladder cancer as people sort of join the webinar, and then we'll deep dive into some of the surgical sort of nuances and some of the trade-offs between urinary diversions, and then we'll take some questions. Bladder cancer is certainly a journey. There are, you know, 500,000 Americans, almost half a million Americans who live with bladder cancer. Almost 80,000 will be diagnosed with bladder cancer in 2017. And unfortunately, despite our best efforts, over 16,000 will succumb to bladder cancer this year. We'll talk about this a little bit more, but this is really a cancer that stems from the li inner lining of the bladder. It's, you know, for folks whose cancer stays on the inner lining, you know, it's a lifelong challenge. It's a disease, as we all know, that requires lifelong surveillance. It's a disease where there's always a risk of a recurrence and requires really both the physician and patients to always keep their foot on the gas and keep a close eye uh, on the bladder to make sure that uh, nothing is missed as, as the years roll on. And obviously the reason why we're here is that sometimes bladder removal is necessary and a urinary diversion is necessary. And we'll, we'll talk about this in detail in a minute. But, you know, the biggest challenges in bladder cancer are that there's still many questions in this disease are, are continue to be unanswered. And, you know, obviously the patients, but the physicians as well, realize that much better treatments are urgently needed. We're, you know, only this last year have we actually moved the needle with some of the immunotherapy agents coming into the space. Otherwise, as this slide shows, over the last three decades, there's really been very little progress in bladder cancer. The mortality has been, as this, you know, <clears throat> as, as the SEER data show, absolutely flat, unfortunately. And, you know, it's the fifth most common cancer, but it receives uh, really a disproportionately small fraction of cancer research funding. And I think this is a huge shout out to BCAN. This is such an important organization for both the patients, but also the physicians who treat bladder cancer. This is really a voice for everybody who's involved with this disease to, A, you know, provide support for the patient community, but also to help raise funds for better research and to answer some of these critical questions that haven't been answered. So at this point, I think what I'd like to do is, you know, Stephanie mentioned my interest in web-based technology, mobile technology. So this is a tool that I developed now a few years ago with actually with my medical school roommate, who is uh, Todd Morgan, who is a urologic oncologist at the University of Michigan. And we both uh, were in practice kind of frustrated by the tools that were available to us to um, counsel our patients and sort of communicate with them. And we, we created some tools with help of some of the technology experts it, that help us really at the point of care in the clinics to sort of communicate with our patients and explain some of these things that are actually very difficult to explain. So I'll walk you through sort of a consultation that, that a lot of my patients have heard when they, when they get diagnosed with bladder cancer. And off of that, we'll use that as kind of jumping off points to discuss some of the nuances of urinary diversions and some of the trade-offs and decision-making and, and sort of, again, answer questions that people want answered. So, so bladder cancer is, is a malignancy that really stems from the inner lining of the urinary tract. So, you know, as we all know, it stems from the urethelium. And, you know, these tumors can grow quite large, but there are a couple of descriptors of these tumors that we pay close attention to. One is grade. Under the microscope, what we want to know when we see a patient with a bladder tumor is whether they have high-grade or low-grade disease. 
In the past, there had been three gradings, a grading system that, that involved one, two, and three, but over a decade ago, that was phased out, and it, sort of modern pathology it reports this as high or low grade. So obviously, high grade is uh, a bit more risky than low grade, but the other um, aspect of a bladder tumor that is very important is how deep does it go into the wall of the bladder. So as you can see, this white ribbon right here, that's the lamina propria. And once the tumor invades that area, that tumor is staged as a T1 tumor. So that's technically called an invasive tumor. That's a tumor that's broken through the lining, the inner lining of the bladder. And for, you know, T1 patients, you know, they, they sort of, they face a set of challenges of their own. This is a, you know, once, once a patient has T1 disease, they have to be watched very, very carefully. And for instance, it is an absolute must that if a T1 tumor is identified that the, that the tumor bed is re-resected because over 25% of the time, there is a residual tumor, but in a, in a large proportion of patients, there's actually tumor that goes deeper than T1, goes into the muscular is propria, into the muscle of the bladder. And it is obviously very, very important to make sure that that's not missed. So very important, you know, absolute standard of care is to, if a patient has a T1 tumor, to for the surgeon to come in again and, you know, with with this resectoscope, which, you know, shown here, to re-resect re that tumor, right? So in patients who have muscle invasive disease, I'd like to just go here. In patients whose tumors have involved the detrusor muscle, the sort of the deep muscle of the bladder, bladder removal is recommended. And, you know, this is sort of beyond the topic of this talk, but most of us very high, uh, strongly recommend neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which means chemotherapy before removal of the bladder, and there's various reasons for that. But the main reason is that for tumors that involve the deeper layers of the bladder, there's a risk that some of the cells have spread beyond the bladder and have gone into the lymph nodes of somewhere else. And there is level one evidence, which is the highest levels we can have in medicine, that there is a benefit to giving chemotherapy prior to surgery in those patients in order to improve patients' outcomes. And so at many large centers who treat bladder cancer, we really strongly believe that chemotherapy, when possible, is important to give before bladder cancer surgery. Now, for patients with smaller tumors, for when somebody really believes that the whole tumor was resected, there are, there are some physicians who are advising to going directly to surgery, but still, uh, most of us believe that our staging, the way we can, we can really identify patients whose tumors go deeply is just imperfect. And if we do have muscle invasion, in general, if the patient is healthy, I really strongly recommend that they consider new adjuvant chemotherapy. And why new adjuvant? Because bladder cancer surgery is a surgery that is usually associated with quite a lengthy recovery, and sometimes it's very, very difficult for patients to receive chemotherapy after surgery, which is an adjuvant setting. But I just wanted to sort of talk about the anatomy here, because I think it's actually quite confusing. And this picture is sort of the image that a lot of us are familiar with from grade school, this is kind of what the internal organs look like. And this is the peritoneum. This is the bow sac. And the bladder and the, uh, <clears throat> the kidneys and the ureters and the lymph nodes that the bladder drains into, they live in the retroperitoneum. They live behind the bow sac. And roughly it looks like this, okay? When the bladder is removed... It is important. So this is this is a male patient, and we'll 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 show this, and then I'll definitely go through what happens in women patients because I think that is uh, it's it's very difficult to sometimes understand some of the changes in the anatomy, and we'll, we'll we'll go through that in a minute. But in male patients, the bladder is removed together with the prostate, and in addition to removal of the bladder, it is important to remove these lymph nodes. That these lymph nodes that live sort of in the retroperitoneum. And it's important to do a thorough lymph node dissection because it serves a couple of purposes. It allows one to know exactly where we stand, how advanced the disease is, but it also sometimes therapeutic. In some patients with 
just a few lymph nodes being involved, we know that some folks are cured by just removing those lymph nodes. So the bladder and the prostate and the lymph nodes are, are removed. Now, when, when the bladder and the prostate are removed, the ureters, so the, the tubes that run from the kidneys down to the bladder obviously need to be directed somewhere and need to uh, bring the urine out of the body. We're going to return to this image, but that's sort of the core of this talk is the urinary diversions, the options that patients have when the bladder needs to be removed. But I wanted to be sure that I go through some more details about sort of what this removal looks like. So I'm going to go and show images of female pelvis to really illustrate some of the anatomy there. So in women, the removal of the bladder is in the urethra is associated with the removal of the anterior vagina and in the uterus, the ovaries, and the fallopian tubes. So now a lot of women come to cystectomy to bladder surgery, their, their uh, uterus and ovaries have already been removed at a different point in their life for other reasons, but generally those organs are removed along with the bladder. Now here this picture shows a plane between, between the bladder and the anterior, which is the front wall of the vagina, which is right here. In reality, these are very intimately related, and they're, the, this plane is difficult to develop. Now, there are, especially for younger women, a lot of us do vaginal sparing approaches, but in general, the anterior vagina, the sort of this wall of the vagina is removed along with the bladder, and the, the rest of the vaginal cuff is closed, and, so, and what women, you know, sort of important to understand is that the vagina can be shortened and narrowed in this process, and um, there, there can be some dyspareunia or you know, some pain with intercourse after the surgery. So that's something to discuss with your surgeon, especially if you hope to be sexually active after cystectomy. Um, it's, certainly, it's certainly possible. Many women are sexually active, but it's something that's important to discuss. And again, there are, there are, for the appropriate patient, there are, there are sparing approaches where you can spare the swallow of the vagina. But you've got to make sure that there's no bulky tumor in this part of the bladder that you, where you're going to compromise the ecologic outcome here. So I want to go and jump back to the male pelvis and show, and show here um, some of the anatomy that's related sort of to the male pelvis. So this is, I showed you a sort of a coronal, which is a picture looking from the front before. This is a picture looking from the side. The feet are this way, and the head is this way, okay? This is the bladder. This is the prostate, and this is the urethra, okay? Now, let me just show you this. The rectum, the rectum sits underneath like this, underneath this whole anatomy, okay? So this is what we'll call a sagittal view. This is looking from the side. And when the bladder is removed, as you can see, the prostate and the bladder are intimately related to each other, and... The bladder is removed along with the prostate, along with the seminal vesicles here, okay? Now, there's a couple of things to show here. So I'm going to push a button, and um, so here's the bladder and the prostate were removed. Now, these nerves here, these nerves are nerves that are responsible for innervation of the uh, erectile bodies of the, of the penis, and um, they're responsible for erection. So one thing to understand uh, for men undergoing cystectomies, that's a sensation nerve. The nerve that produces, that provides sensation to the penis is not harmed. It's, um, people still have sensation and, uh, um, the, you know, things like an orgasm that's actually in some, in, in, your, in one's brain. So people can still be intimate, although generally, uh, erections are, are severely compromised with a surgery. When we take, when we do a prostatectomy and we remove the prostate, we can spare some of these nerves and then can regain erectile function after prostatectomy. After cystectomy, it's possible too, and there are certainly techniques to spare nerves, but they're just not as effective because the nerves basically splay out on the sides of the bladder, and it's much easier to compromise them with, with the surgery. So but there are many techniques where, uh, where many options for men after bladder surgery to regain erections, anything from injections, 
uh, to even a penile prosthesis down the road. And one thing to understand is that the, the sensation nerve is preserved and people can't be intimate after, after the surgery. Now, this is the urethra. And in some men where, you know, there's an invasion of bladder cancer into the prostate, sometimes the urethra needs to be removed as well. A little bit beyond the topic of this talk, but uh, in general, this is, uh, this is spared. So now I'm going to go back to this uh, image here. And uh, this is obviously a picture of the retroperitoneum name of, uh, of a woman. I'm going to use this to kind of illustrate our sort of the, the urinary diversion options. And so I'm going to push a button, and here the, the pelvic structures, including the bladder, were removed, and now the, the ureters need to be connected to uh, a urinary diversion in order to get the urine out of a patient's body. Now I'm going to go back to this image here. This is, as you remember, this is the, uh, the bowel in the bowel sac. And just to walk you through the kind of gastrointestinal tract, this is this is the uh, stomach. This is the small bowel. The first portion of this, the first part of the small bowel is called the duodenum. Then this is the small bowel, and the last part of the small bowel is called the ileum. Okay, and the ileum connects to the large bowel, which is the colon. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this part of the small bowel a lot, which is the ileum, which we use for a lot of our urinary diversions. When we talk about Indiana pouches. I'm going to talk about the colon, and specifically the right colon, which is this portion of the bowel. 